Because I hate Zoom sessions. Hey. Are in the dark. Anyway, go ahead. Okay. Everybody out there, if you're not familiar with me, I'm Lisa Kipps Brown. I want to welcome you to my Facebook Live show, Adaptable Entrepreneurs. And my guest tonight is my cousin, Charles Kipps, that, who I'm really excited to talk with. And also, Charles and I are not only cousins, we share a birthday. So I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so meet my cousin Charles. I'm going to let him tell you his story. But basically, he went from a kid with no connections at all to working with some of the most famous people in the entertainment industry. So, Charles, I want you to start us out. Tell, talk about your background and what you were doing before you ever got into the industry. Okay, I was I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> I won't start there. But anyway, no, I think what Lisa's talking about, when I was in high school, uh, we were we were talking about uh, not everybody here or maybe most of you are not involved in entertainment. You're involved in other businesses. And so what we were talking about is opportunity. And, yeah, I was just a high school kid. I was a writer. always wanted to be a writer uh, for real. And uh, I worked for a local newspaper, the Salem Times Register. It was a weekly paper. And they had the Roanoke Salem Civic Center where all these people, big artists were coming, Herman's Hermits, Mitch Ryder and Detroit Wheels, uh, Sam and Dave, uh, Otis Redding, all these people, this was in the 60s. So I started going there and doing interviews with these, um, I convinced the owner of the Times Register, Ray Robinson, to let me do these interviews. And then I started doing these interviews, I got business cards from all the managers uh, and, uh, uh, you know, agents, whoever who was backstage. Mm -hmm. I had this stack of business cards, but I didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it. And then one day I heard a song called 5, 10, 15, 25, 30 years of love coming out of a window. I went in, there were three African-American gentlemen singing this song with a, uh, one piano. And I said, let me see what I can do with it. And they looked at me like, you know, you're just a little <laughs> Did. <laughs> yeah. And so anyway, make a long story short, through my con I first called the um, manager of uh, Mitch Ryder and Detroit Wheels. If you, you know, some of you may remember it. Some of you might not have been born. And that's one of the cards that you had collected. Yeah. So I yeah. called him uh, and he said, well, R&B is not really my thing, uh, but I uh, call Ron Mosley at Sussex Records, which uh, also had Bill Withers, not at that time, but they went on to have Bill Withers. So anyway, I called him, and these were the days this could happen. I had a little mono tape that they did, you know, one of these little mono tapes, and he said, bring it to New York. So I jumped on a train and went to New York. <laughs> you didn't or plane, or plane, no, I, guess, or, I can't remember a plane. Or, anyway, I went to, no, I guess it was, a, it was a, a plane. I jumped on a plane, went to New York, played it for him. He said, that's great. Let's do it. And uh, wow. really uh, that fast, really yeah, like that, it, was, it was really that fast. I, I full up played this little mono tape. Uh, <laughs> well, I think everybody who knows the song, see, I, you know, these guys wrote it, sees how catchy it is. I mean, it's just it sounded like a hit the minute you heard it, even on that little tape. Yeah, it's a great song. Well, like I told you earlier, I love that song. My sisters and I used to sing it all the time, and we had no idea for years that you were behind it you know, much less that it was the way that you got your start. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, you know, one of the guys knew Van McCoy and he came in to produce it. And, and he, he's a great, was a great arranger and artist. Went on to have the hustle. We started McCoy Kipps Productions. That's how it all started. But if you, if you think about it, it's all this chain, yeah, uh, a bunch of links that, that got you, that, that can get you there. Uh, so I'll give you another another example, uh, and th this is what I've always done. And this is, if you want to talk about how to, you know, almost do anything you want. Mm -hmm. It's it's be, it's a being ready for the opportunity when it strikes, even if you don't know when or where. And two, it's you it's use everything you can. So I'll give you an example. So I'm writing for the Salem Times Register, which is as small as you could possibly get. <laughs> it's a weekly paper. There, you know, headlines were like Mrs. Brown's fence got blown <laughs> over. 
over during the last storm or something. <laughs> so I, I said to Ray Ranieri, who was a fantastic guy, who let me, you know, hire me as a writer, even though I was just a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, one of my idols is is Mickey Mantle. <laughs> uh, I'd really like to do an interview uh, with Mickey Mantle, and he kind of just said, laughed. <laughs> Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> you know? So he said, "Okay, if you if you get an interview with Mickey Mantle, I'll I'll run it. I'll do it." So I thought, "Well, how am I going to do this?" Uh, and, and by the way, I'll I'll come back to something that a friend of mine said a minute ago. So how am I going to do this? Well, <clears throat> I said, "Who's the?" I looked at the, the Yankees were coming to Washington to play a doubleheader on a certain date, like a month ahead, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, who was the manager of the Washington Redskins? And it was a guy named George Selkirk, who I'd never heard of. But then I looked up George Selkirk, and it turned out that he was a major baseball player, et cetera, you know, back in the day. So I called George, George Selkirk's office, and I said, Mr. you know, I asked for him. I said, I want to do an interview with him. And, uh, you know, of course, vanity knows no bounds. If anybody wants to do an interview, I guess any, you know, people perk up. So he said, yeah, come on up. So I go up to his office and I do an interview and it runs in the paper and it, it actually wins me later a Virginia Press Association award. Wow, that's amazing. When I was 19. But anyway, so now I sent him the article and he's so excited and he says, if there's any, ever anything I can do for you, let me know. Now, of course, I knew what he could do for me and that was all part of the plan. Well, okay, so you had already interviewed him and then... Okay. So so then, yeah, so I interviewed him, the story ran, mm -hmm. and then I called him and said after that, a couple weeks later, and I said, Mr. Silker, the Yankees are coming in for a doubleheader. I would love to uh, interview Mickey Mantle. So he said, well, that's not nothing to do with me, really. That's the Yankee organization. But uh, we talked to them, and if I could set up an interview for him. And so a couple days later, he called me, and he said, uh, okay, come on, meet me in my office. I thought, well, I'm going to meet Mickey Mantle in his office. I get to his office. He walks me down to the dugout. And I spent a double header in a dugout with the Yankees. And, oh, my uh, gosh. <laughs> like 20 years That's old kid. So amazing. But anyway, the bottom line is you have to have a plan. You have to be, be ready. And, and you have to have a plan, whatever you want to do. You just have to, you have to just, you know, it may not always work, but you have to have a plan. You know, right. you have to be ready. And, uh, for example, a friend of mine, David Black is his name. He's a, a writer, producer. I was talking the other day about something I'm trying to set up. And he said, well, what would you do if you were 20? And that really hit home because as you get older, you feel like you don't want to do stupid things. Yeah. You know, and they're, but they're not you like you're above it, I guess. Well, no, not necessarily above it. And maybe, maybe you're above it, but also it's, they, you know, what if it sounds kind of stupid. Yeah, maybe you're above it, but you're not above it. It's not stupid, you know. Yeah. And the most successful people have a plan. And and I guess the two things you need to do is, A, have a plan, and B, be ready. Like I was a Boy Scout. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that, that was our motto, you know. Yeah. Be prepared was the motto. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, so so basically that's, that, that's the way into almost anything, you know, is to... I mean, you can't just go up. All right, let's say you're you want you're a, you're a, uh, a programmer, and you and you're a young programmer, and you want to work for I don't know IBM, or you want to work for Apple, you want to work for Microsoft or something. You can't just I, you know. I guess you can apply like everybody else and all that kind of stuff, but I think you need a better plan, meaning that you'd have to start thinking about who's who's working there, who knows somebody who's working there. Because every business is all about relationships, right? Particularly the entertainment industry, uh, it's all about relationships, and which uh, it's not necessarily fair. But uh, and, and by the way, I mean the same thing with uh, my Connor Bard books. It was a chain of events that got that got me to an agent that got into the thing. So I didn't just walk into Simon Schuster and say, "Here's my book." Mm -hmm. so it's always it's always a chain. That, that you have to follow. And then, you know, the other thing I always say to people is you have to be brutally honest with yourself. Uh, for example, 
what I would really, really like to be is a heavyweight boxing champion of the world. <laughs> but <laughs> that's how I would really like to be that. And I would have liked to have been that before. But I, first of all, I didn't weigh enough. And, uh, and now I'm too old to be that. So if that's my goal, I'm not going to achieve. It. Have there ever been any six foot eight boxers? Oh yeah, they're all over the place. Oh, well, okay, so you haven't followed. But, but, you know, I, I weigh two twenty or so, but now you know, like a Tyson Fury weighs two fifty to sixty. Okay. No, and, but back then you're right, there weren't. But my point is, I guess if we're building how to, and by the way, my favorite quote is in a book by uh, uh, William Goldman, who's a screenwriter, and every page in caps he says, "Nobody knows anything." And I don't either. So what I'm saying could be total bull. But my point, <laughs> is, my point is, you first of all, you have to have a goal that's that's achievable. Yeah. Some people don't. I mean, for example, if if you can't write a screenplay, you can't write a screenplay. If you can't write a novel, you can't do it. Uh, like to quote somebody, he wants to have written but not to write. Some quote about a writer, you know. So you have to have an achieve a goal that's at least it can be outlandish, but it's got to be achievable. For example. I can't be heavyweight champion of the world, but I could, not you know, maybe I could be, uh, if I want to be mayor of New York, that's possible. I mean, it's possible. Especially now. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, could, I could start, you know, whatever. Or if I, if I wanted to be uh, mayor of South Boston, I'd move there and start, oh, yeah. put it, start putting it in motion. So I'm just saying. Yeah, mayor everybody of out there, South Boston, Virginia, he means. Which is the town I'm from. Ninety nine point nine percent of the people will never have even heard of that. So, but, but I guess the, the point is, Mayor of New York is not is outlandish but achievable. Heavyweight champion is outlandish and not achievable. So my point is, you have to just figure out what your skill set is and can you do the job. Right. And if you need to do the job and there's a path to it, then that that's what that's what you that's what you need to do, and. Uh, so six degrees of separation is one. And I did a seminar. Let me just look at a couple other things here. Oh, and, but here's the other thing. And this is this is a sad part of particularly entertainment business, but probably uh, all businesses. So I, I, when I teach, too, I, I ask people, what would you rather have, talent or access? If you had to choose between one or the other, would you rather have talent or access? And, you know, a lot of the young students say, uh, talent. But talent without access is going nowhere. Right. And access without talent is why there's bad television and film. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of have both somehow. But, <laughs> yeah, but the unfortunate thing is a lot of people devote all their time to getting the access, but they don't have the talent. And mm -hmm. so what we have in the entertainment business, a lot of people with a lot of access that have zero talent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's, that's the problem. So you have to, A, do you, do you have the skill set to do it, whatever that is? Uh, B, is it possible? Does it, it can be outlandish. Outlandish, is it possible? C, do I have, am I prepared? If the opportunity arises, if I get a call coming for an interview tomorrow or in an hour, am, yeah. I, am I actually prepared? Uh, because I've, I've talked to people that that's something, with, uh, you know, back before this pandemic, of course, uh, they would they would actually get a call and say, "Can you be here in three hours for an interview?" You know, mm -hmm. and all, or or for a pitch. So I mean, if you're not prepared, you've just lost an opportunity. Right. So and then it's you know it becomes complicated these days because now there's so much talk about diversity, which mm -hmm. I, I think you have to be careful with. Uh, I believe there needs to be a lot more diversity, but you can't force it. Like I think a lot of like the entertainment industry is trying to do. Uh, because that leads, that will ultimately fail. Because if you get the job simply, but first of all, it's already failed. Because if you get the job in the entertainment industry simply because you're a white male and you don't have any talent, it's already failed. But if you now, if you now switch that whole thing, and you're saying, well, we need an Asian, we need an African American, we need a woman, we need a LGBTQ woman, or we or, or trans, or, you know, if you if you start plugging in like that, that's not art. You just you just Checking off a quota line. That's like a unit. That's like a government kind of situation. We have right. a quota. So I don't know. So, but the point is, uh, I think you have to, if you have the talent and you have a plan and you're ready, I think you can achieve almost anything. I really do. Mm -hmm. If you have the skill set, yeah, you have a skill set, you have the plan and you're ready when the opportunity arises. There's nothing. Why can't you? I mean, of course you can. If you're ready, 
you can achieve almost anything you want. But I think most people I talk to are kind of vague as to what their goal is. I mean, yeah. I have specific goals, and this goes for all industries. Uh, like my goal was to sell this book. You know, that was it. I mean, I, I had blinders on. It was like this. I have to. I have to do this. Mm -hmm. not, and people are telling me you can't sell fiction. You can't sell fiction. But I wrote it because there. By the way, once again, there was a there was a a, a writer's strike. WGA had a strike, so I couldn't write scripts. So I wrote a book. Yeah. A spec, of course. And I said, okay, I had, I'm, I didn't spend four months on a book not to sell it. And that's when I started utilizing the chain, getting it to the editor, and it sold. Mm -hmm. now, presumably, because it sold, it was it, it was good. It was a you know good book. Uh, but that's what I mean about having, having making sure you check your skill set, making sure you can do it. You know, uh, so. Yeah, and the people who were telling you that it couldn't be done, they were published authors. Right. Yeah, yeah so nobody, a lot nobody's of people, buying nobody and agents, uh, other agents. Yeah. Nobody's buying fiction. You can't you can't do it. And a lot of people, probably most people would have been like, Well, my God, they know what they're talking about. I can't do it. And they wouldn't have even tried. But you have your blinder zone and you're just you're just going to feed my head and you're like straight, straight down the track because first of all like like the book william goldman's book on screenwriting which is a fun book to read you don't have to be a screenwriter called adventures in the screen trade every page nobody knows anything nobody knows anything it's okay. really true nobody knows anything yeah and, and so and that's the other thing uh and i hear people say this about social media there are naysayers everywhere negative trollers whatever yeah if you listen to them you, you'll go crazy you can't listen to anybody that's right. Yeah, yeah, and I love the people that are like, this is how you do it. And social media is a prime example. This is exactly what you need to do, da, blah, blah, blah. Like, no, it's not. Because <laughs> if, if, if it were that simple, everybody would just do it. Now, can you imagine how boring it would be? But, you know, I, Charles, I love that you, you – know, most people think that you that everything already has to be there that when you become successful, you had a silver spoon, you had something that was already laid out for you, something that made it easier. And really all you had was the access, but that's because you created that yourself. You right. know, well, that's another example. Okay. How did I segue from, uh, I mean, this before the books, how did I segue from music to television and film? Uh, I, I decided, okay, the music business became very corporate, which yeah. ruined it for me, actually. Uh, and I think Adam is listening, right? Did, did Adam sign on or no? Um, I don't know if he's on. I don't think he's on here right now. But, 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 but anyway, it, it became, the music business just became very corporate. It, it used to be, look, I produced Aretha Franklin, Gladys Knight, and all the more. There was never an issue until all of a sudden they wanted to hear demos. They would pay for the demos, but instead of, I used to talk to one guy uh, about, and he'd say, you want to produce so-and-so? Yes, of course. Then it became, you have to go to a meeting, oh, a conference yeah. room, and you have to have a bunch of A&R people, artists, rep art people. You got to have mm -hmm. 10 people, and the marketing people, and the salespeople. Mm -hmm. and, and I was like, I won't say what I really thought, because it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to be kicked off Facebook. Hey, but, you can't say anything <laughs> worse than I've said in past episodes. So. But anyway, the bottom line is, all of a sudden, and I remember one meeting, this is when I decided I wanted to change. Uh, somebody said, I played a demo of somebody, not my song, somebody else's song. And uh, they said, I don't know if it's a hit. And it just really pissed me off. And I said, I don't either. Yeah. Nobody knows if it's a hit. You got to record it. I know it's a good song. So you've got to record it. You got to put it out. And then you find out if it's a hit. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I hope I'm not babbling too much. Or this is why you wanted me to come on. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, because I want people to hear the real thing. Okay. So, I, want, so, I don't yeah. want it to be what they're going to read in a book. I want it to be the real thing that happened. So, okay, yeah. So now, I've, from the time. <clears throat> I, I was, oh, by the way, the reason I got in the record business and wrote songs, my mother made me uh, take guitar lessons when I was nine, but that's neither here nor there. So anyway, but my, but basically what I've always wanted to do was uh, be a writer, writer. And I hadn't written a book at this point, I hadn't done any of that stuff. And I wanted to, I wanted to be a writer and I want to be a screenwriter. Uh, and here, and so how do I do that? Well, 
I had been to Elaine's a couple of times, and I, I would suggest everybody. everybody yeah. What, my darling? Explain who Elaine's is. My, my wife just said explain who Elaine's is. Yeah, because a lot of people won't know. One of the reasons I know is from Stuart's books. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Elaine's the is, character always goes in there and eats. There, there, there will never. Yeah, uh, Elaine's late. Yeah, there will never be another Elaine's. Elaine's was a, a restaurant in Upper East Side that you guys, whoever's watching, will look it up. Elaine's restaurant. Um, it started with stars, writers, cops. It just became the hottest spot in the world. In the world, Billy Joel's song uh, mentions Elaine's. Yeah. Uh, Manhattan. Woody Allen opens up the opening scene is at Elaine's. Uh, Woody Allen loved Elaine. Every you know. So so you have to understand that. I knew that Elaine's was a literati kind of a place, you know. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if I'm going to break into television and film, I, I better go there. So I go, the place is packed, it's playing Sinatra music, you know, and I go to the bar to have a drink, and I look, and there's Norman Mailer against the wall, and there's Elaine, and it's like a scene out of a Woody Allen movie. <laughs> so I'm going, wow, you know, how do I wind up? at a table there like that. So I left, I come back a second time and all of a sudden out of nowhere, Elaine looks up points. And, and so, cause I used to tell the story with her. I turned around like who's she pointing at? And she looks at me, you know, cause Elaine was like, Lance, you come over here. Who are you? What are you doing? And so, uh, I also decided that in order to get some credibility, I would get a job at, at uh, variety, the entertainment Bible. Oh, okay, yeah. And I had been interviewed many times by them, and so I made the guy give me a job. So now I have a job at Variety, and I'm now sitting at a table with Elaine, the, the, you know, the queen of New York who would make anything happen. And she did. She knew everybody. She could connect everybody up. Everybody. She connected me to David Black, who was doing a, um, a series with Bill Cosby. So the first words of dialogue I wrote for pay was for Bill Cosby, who at the time in 1994 uh, had the highest rating of any star. Uh huh. Uh, you know, and make so, so your very first song was Grammy nominated. Your very first script was for Bill Cosby. But see, in each case, I had a plan. Now, it may, yeah. it may have been crazy, but it worked. Yeah, so yeah. you know, had that plan. Now, I feel bad for people who. I mean, there are other ways to do it, but there's never going to be a restaurant like Elaine's again. So, you know, that yeah. was kind of an easy segue. From that, I wound up ghosting Bill's books. I wound up having Bill's literary agent take my book to Simon Schuster. So it's, it's all like a, like a, a pinball machine. You know, it's okay. just, every, you know, things would light up and light up. And sometimes they didn't. But, you know, so that's the way I did everything as a, as a chain. Just, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so the agent, when they everybody was saying, you can't sell fiction now. So the agent was somebody that you knew through, it was Bill Cosby's agent. That's how you ended up getting into Simon & Schuster? Yeah, that was Bill Cosby's agent. Okay. But that was because of the connections that you'd already made. Yeah. So I had a, I had a connection. It wasn't a guaranteed anything, even, even if it was Bill's agent. Right. Yeah. But, so... But I, well, actually, it wasn't Bill's agent. What it was was actually no. That's not. It was the editor of Bill's books knew that agent. So it was it was Bill's editor that got me to that agent because there's oh. another agent that's Bill's agent. Oh, okay. And so uh, and there's another agent who represents uh, uh, all kinds of people who told me, no, you can't sell fiction. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm sorry. It, it was not Bill's agent. It was Bill's editor's. For agent friend, but there was still a Bill Cosby. Yeah, right, there's you're still that's those are the connections you're building and building and building and building out, right? Exactly. So, tell, you know, us, how, and, tell us how you ended up now. I know you rock, wrote the song Walk Away from Love that Dave and, David Ruffin recorded, his biggest hit after he left the Temptations, right? Mm -hmm. So, tell us how that came about, how you met him or got hooked up with him. Well, uh, after 5, 10, 15. 25, 30 years of love, your favorite song after that. <laughs> I would uh, think that I can. <laughs> so after that, uh, uh, Van and I became partners. And I think the next step was, uh, and, and uh, the uh, presidents were 
on Sussex Records, which mm -hmm. was distributed by Buddha Records, which had Melba Moore. Yeah. So we did Melba Moore next. We did like three albums on her. I love her voice. A couple albums on, on uh, uh, Gladys Knight. And then I got a call. Uh, the, the lawyer got a call. And, and enter, entertainment industry, you don't have an agent. You have an entertainment lawyer that does all that stuff. They, okay. they do all that stuff. <laughs> so they got a call. You want to do David Ruffin? And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> High school, I was listening to my girl. I mean, it's like, yeah. Oh, I was actually more excited about David Ruffin than anybody else. I bet. Really, I yeah. really was like, oh my God, this is the, the voice. This is this guy. Uh -huh. And we did three albums with him. So but the first album was Walk Away From Love. He came in. And like I said in the uh, thing, that Adam White's blog, he, and what people, what most people don't realize, uh, although it may have changed now, but back then you, you'd have a recording session that started at 10 o'clock in the morning. So, you know, these singers would come in and sing these heartfelt ballads at 10 o'clock in the morning. They wouldn't sing them at 10 o'clock at night with a, with a glass of wine. Uh huh. They would sing them with a cup of coffee or whatever. Maybe they didn't have a glass of wine. So, anyway, David Ruffin went in and sang it. And we all were like, oh my God. <laughs> first take, first take. And uh, came out and he said, is that okay? And we were like speechless. He said, let me try a couple more, but they didn't match it. So that was the very first time he sang it all the way through. The recording is the first time he sang the song. Yeah. God, and it's so beautiful, the falsetto, and I love it. Yeah, but he sang a piece of it when we were rehearsing a little bit, just when he heard it. Yeah. We had to play songs for him. But that was the first time he stepped up to a microphone. Yeah. And... and oh. uh, I'd love to know what it sounded like originally in your head. Well, actually, and keep in mind, Van, I was very lucky because Van yeah. McCoy is an unbelievable arranger. Uh huh. So he, he gave it a little bit of a kick up and, you know, and everything. But no, originally it was a little bit slower. It was a little bit more of a ballad. Uh huh. A little bit, a little bit less disco ish. Yeah. But, uh, but that was, a, you know, the tempo of the time, basically. Yeah. You know, back then, uh, people would think they knew what they were doing, and you would have uh, uh, a you know time. You'd have, you'd have a, a click track that would X number of beats a minute. Mm -hmm. Or would play to that click track, a metronome kind of thing. A click, which is, oh yeah, okay. Electronic click track, and so uh, so there. But yeah, so originally that I kind of thought of it as uh, I mean my very very original thought for that song was a little slower and possibly even slightly countryish a little bit. Oh, huh. Just, you know, just a little bit. So I've heard uh, the reggae version. Yeah, there's been three or four reggae versions, one by oh, okay. I've only heard the one. I can't think of the guy's name. The well, Biddy McLean did one. Yeah, yeah. Ken Booth did one. Somebody else did one. So, uh, and then thanks to Lisa uh, connecting me to Adam White, who used to be at Universal Music. Uh -huh. uh, Universal Music has my catalog, which I sold to them when I got in the movie business. You know, I started writing scripts because no, nobody realizes how hard it is to administer a catalog because you have, you know, all the paperwork and everything else. So anyway, so oh, okay. Universal Music publishes my material. Oh. So thanks to Lisa, I talked to Adam. Adam used to be at Universal for years. He was at Billboard before that. And Adam connected me to the guy who's in charge of working the catalog. Oh, cool. so I, have a, I have a Zoom call with him tomorrow to beat him up and say, get, some, get another cover. Of well, if you need any help, I can get on the Zoom call with you. <laughs> but you see, I even, I even utilize my cousin's connections. Yeah. But you know what's so funny is, um, the way Adam and I connected is I just happened to run across his article about you, the interview that he later told me he'd interviewed you like 30 years ago. I think he said it was 1990. So I didn't know him, but I thought it was a really good interview. And um, I just emailed him. I was like, Hey, I enjoyed that. Blah, blah, blah. And I told you because I didn't know if you'd seen it. And then you went and commented on it. So he emailed me back and he's like, Oh my God, thanks. You must've told me. Charles, because I have a new comment from him. And so anyway, we just ended up emailing back and forth a few times and he's going to be on my show next week. 
So it's really funny that little old nobody me down here in Halifax, Virginia, town of a thousand people, I met Adam because of you, but because I met Adam because of you, you and he connected back up and now. <laughs> so he can, because I've been kind of, you know, recalcitrant with my catalog. I haven't really done anything. With yeah. Him, you know? Yeah. You've so been. I try to build a fire under him, but that's because of you. But once again, that's an example of uh, actually being able to recognize an yeah. opportunity. So when Lisa sent me Adam's blog and said, this is the most popular blog or whatever on his, uh, on his website. And I read his bio, which is he was at Universal. And I said, well, wait a minute. My catalog is at Universal. <laughs> and then, so, yeah, you have to recognize an opportunity. Could have very easily just not done anything. But now at least, and by the way, keep in mind, is I have no idea. I had no idea who to even talk to in Universal. Oh, okay. Because it's so huge. Yeah. You know, it's so gigantic. I don't know how many A&R people they have or how many people they have. But Adam connected me to the guy who's been there for 23 years. Awesome. And, and he's the director of the whole That's program. Great. So anyway, because of him, um, and keep in mind, they, Universal has 30,000 catalogs. God. Like that. So that's 30,000 catalogs times the number of songs. Hundreds of thousands. Uh -huh. So I, I'm not sure what I'm going to be able to accomplish talking to this guy, but maybe I can get him to push Walk Away From Love as another cover. Oh, my God. And it's all, such a great song. Well, but before we get off that, for people who are wondering who we're talking about, we're talking about Adam White. He used to be the um, editor-in-chief of Billboard magazine, and then he went to Universal Mu Music Group International and retired from there. But his website is adampwhite.com. He's going to be on the show next week talking about how Barry Gordy built um, Motown, building off of the failure from the first business that he started. So Adam is the author of Motown, The Sound of Young America. He's going to be on here next week. So, it, But he's got a ton of great articles on his website, adampwhite.com. So y'all should really go check it out. But Charles's interview is the number one post. It's been number one on his site for I don't know how long he said, but I thought that was pretty cool. The greatest of all times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm back to boxing again. I love. I know most yeah. people are going to say that's a brutal sport. What's wrong with you? But I, you know, I, I like. It. I think it's a, a pure sport. But yeah. I mean, anyway, forget boxing. But uh, uh, I like. I like football too. I love football. I do too. I love football and basketball. Um, I want you to tell the story of how the song "The Hustle" came about. Not because I want to talk about music the whole time, but people need to understand that even when you're already in an industry, you got to be ready to recognize opportunities and seize things and jump like that. So I want you the hustle, which is one of the like biggest songs of the seventies. And it just kind of was an accident, right? How it came about. Well, I mean, it's actually a very, very, very good example of, there being an opportunity and taking advantage of it. So Van was recording. And by the way, before I get into, let me talk about Van. Van had a fantastic voice. He started, he did a couple albums at CBS Records. Mitch, uh, what's the sing along with Mitch guy's name? Mitch, whatever his name was. Oh, right? I can't remember. Anyway, he recorded Van. But when I, and we, Van and I had a very successful production company and I started talking and Van said, I want to do an album. And, and I talked to CBS and Atlantic, and they all said, no, no, it'd be a vanity album. Just, you know, he's a successful mm -hmm. producer, he just wanted to do it. But finally, I, I was able to convince uh, Hugo Peretti and Luigi Creatori, uh, who had a record label. And just because they're Italian doesn't mean that they're connected to the mob. But yeah. <laughs> they happen to be. Well, they're more than we're moonshiners just because they our fam. Our parents grew up in the mountains, right? Yeah, so, no, I'm just joking. But anyway, so they said, okay, we can do an album with Van. And Van was uh, the night before the recording session. Van uh, was doing, we, we were both staying. We, it's before I bought, I got a place here. We both had rooms at the uh, Ramada Inn, which is actually a half a block from my house right now. So Van was doing the uh, charts for the next day. Mm -hmm. An all instrumental album, 
and I had nothing to do. So I, I this DJ said, don't come to this club. And I, the club was called Adam's Apple. And I went to this club and everybody was dancing. Uh, this weird kind of thing, touching each other and spinning and all that kind of stuff. And I asked the guy what that was. And he said, that was the Latin hustle, it was called. And so I went back, it was about midnight. Band was still working. And I said, you know, I just saw this incredible dance called the Latin hustle. And it just seemed, and, and, the, and the rhythm and everything just seemed unique. I mean, it seemed like, I don't know what you, and he said, he said, should I do, should I do a song called The Hustle? It was a midnight, and the session was okay. at 10 in the morning. <laughs> I, said, I, I don't know, I would. I mean, why not? I mean, it looks like the guy told me this is the new dance craze, the Latin hustle, as it turned out, the hustle to drop the Latin part. Yeah. So then spent half the night writing The Hustle. And it was the 11th song in the album and became a gigantic hit all over the world. It was recorded the next day, right? Yeah, he recorded it within hours. Yeah. I mean, that song was huge. For anybody that grew up in the 70s, that song was like everywhere you went, there was that song. And again, we still didn't know that you were writing and producing or anything. You know, we were listening to your music every day, David Ruff and the Hustle, all this stuff. We had no idea that, you know, until your mom told our mother, we were like, oh, my God. And mom said, I've been listening to that on the radio every morning. Let's see, but we're getting back to, and this applies to all industries, not just music. Uh, an opportunity presented itself. Yeah. Latin hustle. This could be big. Here's Van doing an album the next day. Van, why not do the hustle? Do yeah. a song called The Hustle. What do you got to lose? I mean, give it a shot. This could be something. So there was an opportunity that was acted upon. It might not have turned out that way, but it did. But if I hadn't said anything, if I just go back to the you know hotel, went to my room, went to bed, uh, there wouldn't have been a hustle. Yeah. So, but you know, it's just I. It's not that I look for opportunities. I think I recognize them. Recon I that's the thing, <clears throat> because opportunity opportunities are around all of us. They might not be at that big of a scale or reach or scope, but there are opportunities that everybody has around them every single day, but they don't have their eyes open. They're not looking, they're not aware of what's going on. So they don't recognize the opportunities. Yeah. Well, I think today social media can hurt and help mm -hmm. become dependent on social media. They become dependent online. So they, you know, you used to have to think outside the box to use the cliche, but you used to have to think yeah. outside. Now you're, you're told, just post this mm -hmm. or go look on LinkedIn or, or post this on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Or, and it's, it's not, you know, it's not that simple. For example, I, I decided to self publish uh, my series about psychiatrists because I got so frustrated with publishers and a lot of major authors are self publishing. Yeah. Including, the Harry Potter series, I think the ebook she self published. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so it was doing, it did okay. It wasn't, it didn't burn up anything. But I had asked Chris and also another friend of mine who's a, a club promoter named Noel Ashman. I asked them both to announce it on their website. Now, Noel Ashman has 500,000 followers or, or, or something. I mean, all mm -hmm. the he's got so many followers, he's got different pages on Facebook. Because you can only have so many. So. Yeah, and and Chris is Chris No, Mr. Big. Yeah, all right, Mr. Big. He's a good friend of mine. So I, I said uh, to ask both of them to post it, and it barely moves the needle. Yeah. So there's a fallacy about social media being something that can sell a book or sell a necklace or sell whatever you're trying to sell. Mm -hmm. So you say, okay, I've done everything. I'm going to post it, and that's all I have to do. You're, it's wrong. Yeah. Now, so I don't know how you feel, at least, about social media, but it's it's not it it's a it's not a it's not a sales tool in my right. <clears throat> It's one tiny there. piece. It's one uh, tiny piece of everything else. And even within social media, you have to know your audience. You know which platforms are they on, and and everything else. It's it's just like everything else in the world. There's no magic to it. The people that go, oh well. 
mine took off because I posted at seven at night and you didn't, you know, maybe, maybe if they were posting the same thing to the same crowd, but in general, <clears throat> um, yeah, it's just one tool. I, I don't believe that it's magic. I mean, yeah, I, obviously it can make some big things happen, but there's not this formula. People want a formula that they can say, if I do this, 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 and this, then I'm going to go viral. And it just isn't going to happen. If it were that easy, everybody would go viral. And no, I mean, if and influence, influencers. Yeah. It's like, like, you know. Well, uh, influencers, yeah. But, you know, it's, but now even also when uh, I caught without a badge, which is one of my nonfiction book, The mm -hmm. Real Housewives of New Jersey took, picked up the book. I mean, that, I'm going to get that story if you want in a second, but, uh, they, uh, but that, that's another example. Let me talk about that for a minute. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. And I want to tell you before you get into it, it's so funny. Once again, I didn't know you wrote that book, and I was at my cousin's house in Des Moines, my cousin on the other side of the family, mama's side of the family, and we're just drinking cocktails, and she's watching Real Housewives, and I'm reading some magazine, and I look up, and there's this book that says Charles Gibbs, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and stop without a badge, and, yeah. you know. So it, it, here I was in Des Moines, going, "What the heck?" <laughs> well, here's what happened. I, I mean, and now some of you out there will actually admit to watching how I mean, watching yeah. Housewives of New Jersey. Most of you won't. But what happened was, I wrote the book ten years before that, and uh, it came out. It did okay. It got optioned by Universal Pictures. Got optioned by Paramount Pictures. Like, you know. A typical Hollywood, and fortunately, you know, I got paid each time it was optional, but it never really got made. And so, uh, 10 years go by, and I get an opportunity to lecture on crystal cruises, uh, transatlantic trip. Crystal cruises is like the top cruise mm -hmm. there. It is. And so, of course, you don't get paid to lecture, uh, but they give you accommodations and free food. Right. And it was stuff. rock and roll cruise, right? No, no, Crystal is like uh, very, very. Uh, yeah, but the lecture wasn't it about writing and music and stuff? No, yeah, but the yeah the lecture, uh, which I'll get to in just one second. So what happened is one morning, I got up and I had like a hundred emails, and I was like, what? And they all, and half of them had a subject matter cop without a badge. And I said, what, what? What is this? What's going on? I thought I thought the ship had gone through a time warp. And I, I was back 10 years. We're in the Bermuda Triangle. You're right. Actually, right. I thought we were the, back 10 years. Wow. Anyway, it turned out the Real Housewives of New Jersey basically used that book as the plot of their yeah. whole first season. And there's nothing I could do about it. I mean, I, and uh, I didn't. I mean, I talked to the lawyers, talked to lawyers, all that stuff. And then I realized uh that well, a lot of them had said there's nothing you can do. It's fair use. I didn't think it was, but anyway. Yeah. Yes, that will happen. No, but my, my no, my lecture on that ship was uh, I should write a book, and, I, and, and it, it, half the ship showed up instead of this, you know, because that everybody, everybody thinks they have a book in them. Everybody, and I think they do. And I and I in my lecture, I had a big, you know, what do you call it, easel, whatever. And I, had, I flipped it up and I only had one thing on it. And it was, if you can talk, you can write. Yeah. So my whole spiel was, look, uh, if you want to write a book, write a book. And if you want to write about your family, that's fantastic. Your family will have something. If you want to write about your experiences. And well, actually what I said first is how many of you think you have a book in you and they all raise their hand. So how many of you have started it? And like four people raised their hand. Yeah. Yeah. How many people have finished it and nobody raised their hand? Um, so the point is you have to want to do it. But yeah, so that was that was my lecture. No, it wasn't it wasn't rock and roll. Uh, oh, okay. I thought it was a music um cruise, like about writing music or something. No, but uh, anyway, so I'm now bouncing all over the place, but yes, that that's uh that was also a situation where they seized an opportunity, I guess, uh real yeah. high in New Jersey, uh at my you know my detriment, or not detriment, but like I didn't get any out of it. Which wow. I, and all I had to do, look, if they had called me, I think they were afraid they would have to pay. And they're, and they, they're Bravo, which is on my NBC. If they had oh. called me, because immediately after that, the book, all right, the book began, was, was out of print. 
So it was being offered on eBay for seven, eight hundred dollars. Yeah, I saw it. And, and so, yeah, so, so then uh, Simon and Schuster jumped in because I just sold my. That's the other thing about being ready by accident. I just sold my Connor Bard mysteries to Simon and Schuster, uh -huh. so I was able to say, "Can you guys roll with this right away?" So they did. Yeah, the sales, the sales were pretty big, but anyway, uh, I, I they were afraid I would asked for money if they had called me and said we're going to put this on the air and yeah. give me complete time i'd say how much do i owe you i mean yeah, and, they, they wanted to ask for forgiveness and not permission that old no, but, but here's the other thing it shows yeah. you how stupid the corporate world can be uh bravo is owned by nbc nbc is owned by universal universal owns publishing companies the book was out of print uh -huh. what, what they should have done is contacted me yeah we're going to bring the book back at the same time uh -huh. that we're yeah. running the show and we're going to offer for sale through us. Yeah. They weren't, they weren't smart enough to do that. I mean, yeah. to them, see, that's what I mean. That's why a good corporate executive is worth his weight in gold. A good corporate executive would have looked at it and said, wait a minute, this is an opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. to make a lot of money. Cause what are we doing? We're promoting this book basically. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But they didn't do it. So, you know, you know, even in the corporate world, I'm sure there are people as stupid as there are in the entertainment. Oh, world. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but there are some pretty dumb people in the entertainment industry. I'm telling well, you. And with that, with that book and probably and a lot of your other books, like the, um, the Connor Bard Mysteries and stuff, you you work with and know a lot of like New York City homicide detectives and so forth, right? Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they call my apartment. They used to. I haven't seen a lot of the guys retired. I um, saw I saw a picture of you with Bo Deedle. So yeah, I know, I know Bo very well. Yeah, I love him. I love how he makes up words. <laughs> you love Bo Deedle, really? Okay. I'm sorry, what? I said you love Bo Deedle. Yes, what? I love him. I will see him, uh, you know, like as a guest on whatever news or whatever, and I love how he just makes up words on the fly. He is so it just cracks me up. And so, you know, should I tell him he has a stalker or something? Or yes, what? tell him. Tell him I want to meet him. He's so funny, and I love him. And it to me, just seems so New York, you know. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no, he, he is cool. I love him. You know, I've known him forever. Matter of fact, I gave him a. You know that Bodino also. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Bodino is, he ran for mayor, but he also has done a lot of acting, and he was in the Irishman. Uh huh. That and all that stuff. So he's become. He was in violence. He's in all this stuff. Well, guess what? His very first job as an actor was. Uh, what? Exile, the Law and Order movie. I did. Oh, really? And that's. I gave, I gave, right? Bo, I gave Bo Deedle his first acting job ever, and he had three lines on the on the bow of a boat. Oh, funny. But, but once again, because uh, I knew him as a cop, I gave him three lines. Yeah. In the movie, and that was the beginning of. You know, of, of a friendship that may, yeah. or, may or may there may or may not be opportunities. As a matter of fact, the book I'm working on now, uh, he plays a role in it. Uh, oh. It's about a promoter. I mean, it's a real nonfiction book. But anyway. Oh, in his oh, it's nonfiction. Okay, so yeah. it does have his name. Yeah. yeah so sure. the opportunity here is for you to tell Bo that I love him. I will. I will tell him. <laughs> well, yeah, I just love the way he makes up words, and you know, and so you wrote Exile, um, the movie Law and Order Exile. You wrote that, and you got him the acting bit in it, right? And that's how he. No, goes, I wrote that, and he bugged me to death in a lane, just wanting to be in it. So, <laughs> so that's how it happened. I, I didn't. No, I was the producer as well, so I, I said, okay, fine, you're in. So, how did you? How did you move? Okay, I know. Um, writing newspapers um, for the newspaper. Then you moved into music. You took that. You transitioned into screenwriting. How did you then transition into producing and directing? Well, I, have, I haven't yet to direct. I'm not ready to. But no, but pr oh. uh, producing. Well, I've trans I I kind of made the transition of producing during the Cosby Mysteries, the second second half of the season. Okay. Uh, when uh, there was a big shakeup. And Bill said, uh, uh, you can fire anybody you want, but you can't fire Charles. So then I became kind of a producer. So 
but and then I produced a bunch, but that was kind of like the segue. I was kind of like a consult consulting producer. Mm, okay. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, look, what what's going on right now with Bill Cosby is worth at least a mention. I, yeah. I I saw nothing at all. I mean, he was always America's dad in my presence. He was always, you know, and so I don't know what happened. I don't know. I'm just saying my experience. If somebody said, "Is it possible?" I would say, "No, not for what I know." Yeah. I'm not saying it's not. I'm not saying. Right. That what you saw. I'm yeah. just saying, my personal experience, I, I can't fathom it. It was so surreal when it, when it, all this stuff broke. It was just to me, it can't it can't be possible. This yeah. is the greatest guy in the world. It can't this can't be possible. And keep in mind, I ghosted three of his books. Mm -hmm. he two television shows for Nickelodeon. I wrote Fat Albert in the movie with him. I was around him a lot. Yeah. And then, of course, most of the accusations uh, were many, many years ago before I even met him. So mm -hmm. I don't know what happened. And I'm saying I'm not, I'm not defending or I'm not accusing anybody of lying. I'm just saying my, my personal yeah, experience. It was going right. right. I mean, it's like any true crime. You see, basically, the friends and the family are like, oh my God, they could have never done that. You know, I mean, yeah. I know somebody. And I won't say what they've done, but very bad thing. And I would have never, ever, ever guessed it. Never, ever would have guessed it. So, right. you know, you most of us know that we all have little pieces of ourselves that people don't know. And yeah, I mean, exactly. So I wrote all kinds of music you didn't know. So yeah. <laughs> Wait, what? No. I wrote, I wrote all kinds of music you didn't even know. So. I knew the music. I didn't know you wrote it because you I didn't know I'm joking. I'm joking. So, yeah. So, anyway, so we'll leave that where, where it is. Yeah. No, but okay. You know, yeah, because I've never asked you about that. That's what I assumed was the case, but I never asked because I felt yeah, like it, it, you know. was just, it was shocking. It was completely shocking. I mean, it was like yeah. broadsided, you know, blindsided. And you know, some people will kind of say, "Well, you could, you couldn't tell tell what I work with a guy. What I'm not a you know, if if he were so inclined, I'm I'm not a woman. So you know, my point was, my yeah. point was, I I I just saw nothing but this good guy. Yeah, that's, all that's, yeah. that's my experience. I don't know what happened or did. Well, not to talk about it too long, but it was so heartbreaking because he was just so beloved. You know. Grew up watching the Cosby Show, and when I was pregnant, got Tom that book. Um, what was his book about being a dad? Anyway, it was just so funny. Um, so yeah, it was heartbreaking. Well, that was, yeah, that was before me. That was Parenthood, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Parenthood. I love that book. So <laughs> yeah. Well, um, so or oh, how did you did you and Chris know first started working together? First start working together. With the law and order thing, or did y'all already know each other? Well, once again, you go back to Elaine's. That's <laughs> where I met Chris through David Black. Okay. Uh, so it was, you know, that's how you would meet people. It was social media without the internet. That's what oh, Elaine yeah, was. real social media. That's yeah, what without the internet. Plus, people would leave packages for me there because they knew what Bill Cosby would actually drop off scripts. Oh, and, and other things and cigars he used to say. I I guess, yeah, I say cigars. Mr. Gray <laughs> dropped off something. Mr. Gray That's was funny. Bill's driver. You so, know, I'll, I always tell people because they they're freaked out by social media. I'm like, social media has always been around. It's just a different form now. It's online, and the way that I, I have a a, car, a comic that Aaron, my daughter, drew um, for me, and it's um. What's his name? Oh, I'm, ugh, the British are coming. My brain just went blank. Who was it that did that? <laughs> I sound stupid. You're the American Revolution. The guy <laughs> that the British are coming, not Patrick Henry. Oh my God, I feel stupid. My brain just went. But anyway, he's sitting on a horse and he's messaging, he's tweeting, the British are coming. Paul Revere. Yes, Paul Revere. Okay, everybody out there, I'm really not that stupid. But my brain was in a different place, not on American history. So, yeah, but Paul Revere, can you imagine him tweeting, the British are coming, instead of riding through the villages on his horse, you know? Same yeah. thing. It's just a different tool. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same idea. 
I mean, yeah. the difference is people get lazy because it's on the internet. I used to have to get up, get in a cab, go up 88th Street. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I had to make an effort to connect. Right. That, that was the other difference. If I wanted to, and I knew I'd see people up there. I knew, matter of fact, almost everything I've ever done, can, I can connect back to her, including the books, you know, because that's where I met. That's so cool. But, but the point is you had to make an effort. You had to go there. You had to be there. You had to be present. If I yeah. want to, if I, I don't need to make an effort on Facebook. And if, I, and if I, you want to make the analogy, so let's say LinkedIn for professionals, if you want to make the analogy, okay, Elaine's is there, but you still had to go. You had to talk with people and actually have a relationship. You can't just have an account on LinkedIn and show up and read everybody's stuff and expect people to go find your profile. Be like, oh my God, you're so awesome. I want to hire you or whatever. So. Right. It, it one is analog, one is digital, but the same thing. You can't just show up. Ah, oh, that's a very that's very very good. I mean, I I may use that. I will use that in the lecture. Right. Oh, okay. not even gonna pay me. <laughs> but you have to show up. That's and right. showing up online is slightly different than showing up in a restaurant. Right. Well, and imagine have, like you have to be present. Yes. And Elaine noticed you. She noticed you because of something different about you, whether it was the way you look, whether whatever. Elaine noticed you, and then she wanted to learn more about you, and then she was able to connect you with other people. Same thing on LinkedIn that people own there, if you're sharing things or commenting, somebody you never know who might notice you and feel like, for whatever reason, they that you have something in common and they want to get to know you better. You never know what might come out of it. No, you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, I would suggest to everybody on social media carefully read posts of their friends on Facebook and everything. Because if I, you know, the case with Adam White and you, mm -hmm. so you like you're like the Elaine of now with that. <laughs> so because you, you know, and Elaine would. would Elaine would just connect people. That's what. Yeah. And by the way, that's why she her restaurant was so popular. Not well, first of all, people would complain the food was terrible. <laughs> it was actually terrible. But all you everybody tonight look up Elaine's restaurant. It wasn't actually terrible, but it was not fine food. And yeah. Fine, and people would and so and people complain that Elaine was gruff and, and throw people out and stuff like that. Well, hey, it was her place. Huh? It was her place. She could do what yeah. she wanted. But what I'm, what I'm saying is, I want, people, Tom wanted to say hi. Hey, how are you? <laughs> He's like, who are you talking to? <laughs> so I was like, come in here, say hi. <laughs> how you been? Good. How about you? <laughs> oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, a little bored. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, I know. <laughs> we'll see you. <laughs> that's that. Yeah, that's the thing. A little bit boring. But but yeah. anyway, the bottom line is oh, he this means what? Yes, he means with COVID. It's like oh my god. But why did people go to Elaine's? Yeah, they, because she connected people. Mm -hmm. She was LinkedIn. You know, yeah. she was Instagram. She was everything. If she gave you this, uh, if she gave you a stamp of approval, oh, man, you were just off and running. Yeah, so it was like if Elaine liked you or shared you. Yeah. She made you go viral. So that, yeah, that exactly. that's what people need to understand. At the end of the day, it's all humans, people. And you have you can't just worry about the algorithms and the times of day and all that. You you literally have to treat it like you know, and the other thing I tell people, if you go into a party, you don't just talk about yourself all the time. If you do, nobody wants to talk with you. You don't right. talk with Hey, I'm Charles Skipson. I did this, baby, 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 because everybody's going to leave you. And but people get on social media, and all they want to do is post about themselves, you know. But you have to go in, and you have to ask people questions, and comment, and share, and you know, make your not in a way that's disingenuous, but genuinely interact with people. Pretend you're at a party, but it's virtual, and get to know people. And then people will want to get to know you. No, you're, you're you're absolutely right. And plus, I mean, there's so much out there. Before, so before social media, I was very careful. I didn't even really bring up my music thing. Though I was writing scripts. Uh huh. I didn't. I didn't even. It's not that I didn't want to. My lovely wife Aida 
would always say to me, why don't you talk about your music? Because I thought, well, you know, I'm writing scripts, I wrote music, people can say, well, what's he, who does he think he is? Kind of stuff. Oh, you feel like it would blur the lines professionally? Yeah, I, I, I did. But yeah. now, so I didn't ever talk about it. It, it, it was in none of my bios. Oh, yeah, I wondered why. Yeah, because I had noticed that the other year when I was working. Yeah, so I, did, I just decided it was like, first of all, it didn't necessarily have too much relevance, which is what I was doing. Yeah. And secondly, it just said, so anyway, but now it's different. Now everybody knows everything. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I went, you know, uh, you, go, you go somewhere before the pandemic, of course, and uh, in a restaurant and somebody, you know, if you're talking and you just say, hi, introduce yourself, period. And then they, they Google you. Mm-hmm. And they, you know, all of a sudden they know your whole life story. Yeah. It never used to be that way. So, so yeah. I don't know. I'm not, look, I'm not beating up social media. It's a good oh, no, I, yeah. You just have to, you can't expect it to be magic. And you also need to be aware of what you do. People who go on there and say really re- stupid things and then think it's not going to affect them professionally. You know, it's like if you go out and you have a DUI and you wreck, people know about it. That affects you. You know, well, it, how many it, stories it, it, have I seen? Yeah, you know, how many stories I've seen someone getting fired because of their comments on right. social media? Yeah. You know, be be professional. And how can you not know that if you put it on social media that people are gonna not what do you think they're not gonna see it? I yeah. Mean, it's crazy, right? right? And most people, you know, they just hit return, they hit send without even thinking. But I love what you said. You have to show up. That's mm-hmm. probably the most important thing of all this all my babbling and all this stuff. You have to show up. Yeah. It, it may be social media, it may not be a restaurant or a bar, but you still, you have to be, you have to be present somehow. You have to figure out how to be present. So right. Media, not yeah. just, you know. And be uh, genuine and interact with people and really be interested in them instead right. of just in yourself. Right, exactly. Um, so, buddy, oh, oh Char, sorry, Charles. So buddy is my nickname growing up. Yeah, I, I so, have managed to not say that. That's before. okay. You can call me Buddy. I know, but, but I, I, the world will call me Buddy, which is okay. I don't care. Okay. I'll um, be buddy. So, tell them. I know that you have a webinar that people, even though the live part is over, that people could still go um, and take yeah. your webinar. Yeah, right? a script magazine. I have a webinar, 10 Steps to Breaking in, Into the Entertainment Industry. I have another webinar. I have a couple webinars. Another one about uh, how to write a mystery. Another one about a producible script. I think I have like three webinars that they can go on if they want and buy the webinars. Yeah. Okay. Script. We'll and, and we'll add those in the show notes on, on YouTube. Yeah, and we'll script, add script, yeah script magazine. The comments on Facebook. And also, just to let y'all know, we're thinking about or we're going to do some type of course together. We're just trying to figure out what, what, what we want to do. Well, and you're I'm supposed cool. to figure it out, Lisa. You're, yeah. you're supposed to figure it out. What happened? Yeah, we just have to narrow it down and figure out what we want to do so that we're not overwhelmed and y'all aren't overwhelmed initially. We've got to start little and then grow big. But also your site, charleskips.com, if anybody out there is a writer and y'all want a script reviewed or your book reviewed, correct? Charles? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So you can go to charleskips.com and you can actually get him to review your script or your book or whatever, your manuscript, and give you his honest professional opinion. And this is somebody with, what do you have, 50 years of experience? Well, like, I, I guess that I'm 72. So I, yeah, uh, 50. I was 20 when I, yeah, when I started doing this. Yeah. So. Music, yeah. So, um, so anyway, great resource. I mean, you know, with, with, and I know I'm his cousin, so I know I'm biased, but to be able to have access to somebody like him with the amount of experience he has and the connections to be able to have access and get him to review your writing is really invaluable. Um, and I'm not making anything. I don't get a cut of anything he he sells, but by by the way, Lisa was the one that helped me set up the website. So. When you, yeah. when you see it, yeah. she's well, just based on all that stuff. So, well, but. we are going to do our courses. We just have to, we have to get the time, and then, and we have to figure out yeah. exactly what we want to do. We just have so much stuff in our head. We got to figure out 
what right. to get out first in little chunks so that you know so that it's valuable to people. Well, I mean, I guess you want to do something that's that's brief, concise, and helpful, right? Basically. Right. Yep. Well, I really appreciate you coming on here, and I'm so glad to see you because we haven't got to see each other in so long. I know. I'm I'm, I'm happy you invited me. I had a really good time. I hope I didn't babble too much or anything. But no, you, know. you didn't. I love all the stories, and everybody else will because most people never get to hear the behind the scenes stories, and right. they don't. They don't. You know, people lose track, lose sight of everybody is just human. Doesn't matter who they are, how successful they are. They are human and they know people and they have mothers and fathers and kids and, you know, we're all alike. And that's why, like you said about relationships, that's why relationships are so important because that's how people trust each other is through those relationships, even if it's a second or third or fourth degree. Well, um, I, I think that, that I would, I would leave whoever is here with, one thought, you have to show up. Uh, Lisa, Lisa's call. <laughs> That's so profound. You have to show up. Look, yeah. I could have gone to Elaine's and not <clears throat> talked to anybody. That's but right. You know, you know, Elaine, you know, Elaine would you know, notice me and start introducing me to people. I could have not taken advantage. I could have. Exactly. You know, I, I came in there every day and showed up because sometimes I didn't feel like going there. And Elaine would call, you know, if you don't, you almost have to be there like, she almost like a, a wife, a <laughs> wife. Like she had to do it every night. So, so I'd have to sometimes psych myself up. Yeah. And go out. Well, and, and that's like all of us. We don't feel like doing what we have to do every day. We don't feel like making the phone calls or writing the emails or whatever. So even though people think going to Elaine's to dinner is just fun, it's like anything else. You sometimes you just don't feel like doing it, but you yeah. do it because you know you need to. Yeah, but going to Elaine's, I know we're running over, but going to Elaine's for dinner was never considered fun because it was so, it was so intense. I was, of course it was fun, I'm not saying, yeah. but, but there was a certain tension from yeah. the time you walked in the door and, and buzzed up, you know, the, the bold-faced names everywhere. Yeah, like, I would love to have been able to go in there just one time. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah. Anyway, so thank you, Lisa. So. Thank you so much for coming. And if Aida is still sitting there, by Aida. Thank you. Yes, Aida. Now, 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 now I'm going to get. The, now I'll get the critique. She'll have. Oh, it was awesome. I love it. You both did a great job. Oh, she gave me. A, Thank you. Oh wow. Y'all, if anybody who's watching this, if you enjoyed this, go to my website, LisaKipsBrown.com, and you can watch this again. But you can also see all my other. Facebook live videos now in, in the past and in the future. And as I said, Adam White will be on with me next week. The guy that Charles was talking about who worked for Universal Music Group and Billboard Magazine and is the author of the book about Motown, the book about Motown, the Bible. So yeah. thanks so much. I'll talk with you later. Okay, yeah, we'll talk later. And uh, now, have, oh, leave studio, let me see. No, you don't have to leave yet. I'm gonna do in broadcast and then you can leave, okay? Oh, okay, I'll wait. Say bye to you. Okay, so you're gonna do what now? Yeah. You're gonna bye end everybody else. <laughs>